Well, good morning. Good morning, everybody. I want to wish everyone, that's a, I feel like I'm in a hole. Does it sound like I'm in a hole? Uh, I am uh, starting out 2020 in a hole this year. <laughs> They're going to get it fixed. It didn't sound like this a moment ago. How about that? Uh, we, uh, I want to wish everyone a very, very, very happy New Year. I love this time of the year when we get to reset and refresh and reevaluate what God's doing in our lives. I, uh, I was thinking about it being the year 2020. How many of you guys can believe it's 2020? It's, it's absolutely crazy. I, I was thinking, man, I, I wonder how far we are from 1990. Do you realize that that we're as far today from 1990 as 1960 was from 1990. Does that make anybody else feel old? Can, can, I, can I really make you feel old? Pastor Noah in 1990 was two. I, I all of a sudden feel very, 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 now that I've depressed everybody about it being 2020, I do want to encourage you. I was thinking, of how many of you guys remember what 1990 was like? A, a few. I got to thinking about 1990, and I, I got my team to help me pull some pictures from 1990. I think I, I think I have a few of them for you this morning. How, how many of you guys remember MC Hammer in 1990? All right. Honesty. How many of you guys had hammer pants in 1990? If you lie, you fry. That's right, that's right. I, 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 if you were really, really cool, you had hammer pants in 1990. You remember those flip phones? You had the little antenna that it extend up on that you had to be careful it'd break off. That's right. Um, how many of you guys remember the Saved by the Bell and the Zach Morris fade haircut? I had that haircut. I was shaved on the sides with the long hair in the back. I know that's hard for you to imagine. And here's some other pictures I think are hilarious from 1990. You had uh, uh, Beverly Hills 9210. How many of you guys remember mom jeans? If you guys raise your hands, I have questions about you. Um, and then Michael Jordan jumpsuits. I had some sweet Michael Jordan. As a matter of fact, I had that one right there with the Jordan version 3s. I was kicking it. I'm, I was bad in 1990. Bad to the bone. I, I think, I, do I have another picture? Is that, is that, is that it? That's all I've got this morning. I, I was thinking about this. The I've Fallen and I Can't Get Up Life Call commercial aired in 1990. <laughs> and it's still airing today. 30, 30 years that's been airing. The movie Home Alone aired in 1990. Telling you what, 1990 was a good year. I'm a little depressed though, because it was a long time ago. Um, I, I was going to uh, sing this song for you this morning that, that was a number one hit in 1990, but I decided to spare you. Thank you, Mike, I appreciate that. But the song Ice Ice Baby by Vanilla Ice aired in 19, a number one hit in 1990. And everybody says, thank you for not singing that. Or you wish that I would have so you could have videoed it and uh, held me hostage over it. 1990 was a long time ago. We're here in 2020. And I believe 2020 holds great potential for your life. I love this time of year. As I said a moment ago, I love the opportunity that the flip of the calendar presents in enabling us to reassess and to reevaluate, to refresh ourselves and to get restored for the next season of our journey. I believe that 2020 holds great potential, but I also believe that potential doesn't just magically materialize. I believe that it takes some intentionality on our part 
intentionality in our habits and in our values and our priorities in our lifestyles and, and how we go about living our life if we want to see the potential that 2020 presents materialize. So over the course of the next several weeks, we're doing a series entitled 2020, and we're going to look at some principles that I believe that if we can adopt in our lives and live these principles out, they will help facilitate 2020 being the best year you've ever had. How many of you guys want to have a year unlike you've ever had before? I want to have the best year yet. And so we're going to talk about some principles that will help to facilitate that in your life over the course of the next several weeks. The principle that I want to talk about this morning, that I, that I want us to adopt, that I want us to embrace, is healthy spiritual habits. The principle that I want us to embrace in our lives in order to have the best year yet is healthy spiritual habits. Habits. Say that after me this morning. Healthy, spiritual habits. I love this verse in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. The writer says, For physical training is of some value. Physical training is of some value. We cannot deny the positive effects of physical training. The Bible even articulates it has some value, but godliness, but healthy spiritual habits have value for all things. Say all things. Godliness, healthy spiritual habits have value for all things holding promise. There, there's, there's a good promise for us when we embrace healthy spiritual habits and the promises for us when we embrace these things hold value in two different spheres. They, they hold value in the present age and in the age to come. Wow. You know, physical training has value for the here and now, but the Bible promises one day from dust we came to dust we're going to return. It, it holds value, but it's holding value in this life for this time. But godliness, healthy spiritual habits hold promise both for now and for the age to come. I have found in my life that healthy spiritual habits have the power to change every other area of my life. It changes how I think. It changes how I process. It, it, it changes how I live. It changes my priorities and my values. It changes how I do relationships and, and how I operate in my career. It changes everything in my life when I adopt healthy spiritual habits. Paul, over and over again throughout his epistles, compares athletic training to spiritual training. Repeatedly, if you, if you read the epistles that the Apostle Paul wrote, he keeps comparing our, an athlete's training to, a, to our training as followers of Jesus. And, and he uses comparisons uh, like if, if a physical athlete goes into training because they want to win the prize, who are we as followers of Jesus not to discipline ourselves because we have an even greater prize awaiting us? And so he's comparing these two things as an encouragement to us to, hey, hey, get some things in order. I, I was reading recently that LeBron James, arguably the greatest basketball player of this generation, some would argue the greatest basketball player that has ever lived. I grew up in the Michael Jordan generation, and I think that's, so I think that's a falsehood. <laughs> and I'm not starting that argument today because some people are passionate about it, but MJ's just better. <laughs> but do you know that he spends a million and a half dollars a year to maintain his physical body. What has been amazing about him is the longevity of his career. And, and there's only one reason that he's had such a great career for such a long period of time. Is that he 
has a habit of taking care of his body that has produced longevity in his career. Let me tell you something, church. If you want to have a longevity in the spiritual journey, you better have a habit of taking care of your spirit man. Because just like basketball will beat your body up physically, walking out the spiritual journey will beat you up if you're not taking care of your spirit man. Paul, in his parting words to his son in the faith, Timothy, reminds him of this. This is a very familiar passage of Scripture. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, Paul says this to Timothy, I'm reminded, in verse 5, of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. And I'm persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you. I, I, I'm, remi- I'm writing to remind you. Paul is imprisoned in Rome awaiting execution. So he, he's writing a, a parting letter, a charge to his son in the faith. And he's saying, hey, I want to remind you of some things that you need to adopt if you want to finish this race well. He said, number one, you need to fan the flame of the gift of God in your life. Can I tell you, it's not somebody else's responsibility. It's your responsibility to take care of your spirit, man. We're here to help you. We're here to put tools in your hand. We're here to motivate you. But you can't make a horse drink water. You can lead them there, but you got to drink for yourself. you got to fan your own flame. Paul says, number one, I want to remind you of this. It's your responsibility to take care of your spirit man. It's your responsibility to fan the flame of the gift of God that is in you. I know it's in you because I laid my hands on you. Now I want to remind you of this, verse 7. For God did not give you a spirit of fear. I want to remind you, I don't care what you face in 2020, your God is bigger. Do you know that in the Word of God, there is recorded 365 fear knots? There's a fear knot in the Word of God for every day of 2020. So I want to remind you to not fear, but take courage. Because your God is bigger. He said, God's not giving you a spirit of fear. No, this is what He's given you. He's given you a spirit of of power. The word power there in the Greek is the word dunamis. It, it means explosive power. It's where we get the word dynamite. You need to know that you have something on the inside of you that is explosive in nature. There's something that has been deposited in you that when you fan the flame of that gift, it creates a power that's bigger than anything you're going to face. He goes on to say, not only have you been given a spirit of power, but you've been given a spirit of love. The word love there is the word agape, and it's God type love. It it literally means an overcoming, an an all-encompassing. There's nothing that can defeat this kind of love that's been deposited in you. And typically, when we read this verse in 2 Timothy, we celebrate, we preach about in the church that God's not given us fear, but power and love. And I celebrate those things, but I want to tell you, the verse doesn't stop there. Paul takes it one step further to remind his son in the faith what it takes to finish well. Son, you, you got to live by, by, by faith and by courage, not by fear. Son, you got you to live by power and you got to live by love. But there's one other ingredient that can make all the difference in your journey. And he says spiritual discipline. God has given you power, love, and self, say self. Self-discipline. Y'all kind of trailed off there. Let's try that again. Self-discipline. I believe that self-discipline is a key to you experiencing all that God has for you in 2020. 
Paul in this passage over and over again reminds Timothy, hey, hey, you need to know, you got to fan the flame. You've got a responsibility. This isn't just all God and none. No, no, you have to exhibit some qualities, put some things in practice so that you can fulfill the destiny of God for your life. I'm going to give you my definition of self-discipline. Self-discipline that Paul is talking about here is developing healthy spiritual habits. And healthy spiritual habits are a key to you having your dream year. So I want to take just a few minutes this morning and outline five healthy spiritual habits and the promises that they hold for your life that will facilitate you having the best year that you've ever had. Five healthy spiritual habits that have the power to transform everything in your life. You guys ready? Here's number one. This is really, really, really deep. Read your Bible. Number one is read your Bible. If you want to fulfill God's destiny for your life, you want to have a dream year, then you've got to make it your habit to read your Bible regularly. I would encourage you daily. You, you need to be in the Word of God. If there was just one habit that I could encourage you to adopt, if there was only one, I've got five, but if there was only one, it would be this one. It would start right here. With reading the word, it, it changes everything in your life. It has the power to transform everything. And you know what really the prize of reading the word of God is? And here, here's why you need to read the word of God. Because the prize of reading the word of God is knowing God's will and knowing God's way. Why, why do I need to devote this amount of time and energy and effort day in and day out to reading the Word? Because there's only one way you know the will of God is through the Word of God. The Word shows you God's will in God's way. I love this verse in Psalms 119, verse 105. The writer says, Your Word, speaking of the Word of God, is a lamp unto my feet. It's a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. See, the Word of God will show you the will of God. It'll show you the way of God. It'll, it'll show you how to get from where you are to where you're going safely. It illuminates. I love how the, the Bible writes this and how God constructed it. It's a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. See, the Word does two things. It illuminates right where I am and it also illuminates which way to go. And if, I, if I, my feet weren't illuminated, if I didn't have a lamp on my feet, I'm liable to step in a hole and hurt myself. But if I didn't know where I was going, all I could see was right here and I would never make progress. See, the Bible allows us to know the way to go and how to get there safely. You need to make it a priority in your life. If you want 2020 to be a dream year, you got to be in the Word daily. It shows you the way and the will. It shows you what to do. And, and can I tell you, I'm not even talking about destiny. I'm just talking about in real life circumstances. Yes, it will show you the destiny, the doors that you need to go through. But I have found the more I devour the Word in my life, the more I know what to do moment by moment, day by day, but in conversations that I'm having. I remember years ago, we had a, a volunteer here who was helping us in different capacities. And, and I, I was walking alongside them, kind of discipling them and training them and and, and they were leading some of our other volunteers, and they had got frustrated because uh, people weren't doing what they were asked to do, and so they started developing a little attitude. Anybody, anybody know what it's like to work with people? You know what I'm talking about, right? There's, people have this wonderful habit of just not doing what you ask them to do. And so, and so he's getting frustrated, and I, and I pulled him aside and I said, listen, you need to check your attitude. Your attitude's not right. 
Pastor Noah, come here. And I stand right there. And so this is him. This is me. It wasn't Noah. And that volunteer, when I said, hey, you need to check your attitude. Your attitude's not right. This is what that volunteer did. Don't you tell me what to do. Jesus. <laughs> Something started rising up on the inside of me. And, and the first thing that I said was, don't you put your finger in my face. And it was everything that I could do, put your finger in my face. Not to do this and break that thing off. You don't know me. And I, and I told him, don't you put your finger in my face. And he did it again. Oh, Jesus. I was about to come unglued on him. Let me tell you, church, it happened right after that foyer before service. There's about to be a fight in the foyer. It wasn't going to be much of a fight, but there's going to be a fight. And you know what happened in that moment? The word of God rose up on the inside of me. And the verse in the New Testament, speaking of Jesus, came immediately to my mind. And the verse was this. A bruised reed he would not break. Dang. And so, by the grace of God, I diffused the situation and helped that individual. Can I tell you, I wouldn't have handled that situation right if I wasn't in the Word daily. See, that's what the word, it doesn't just show you the will and the destiny, the big picture. It shows you what to do in every situation and circumstance that you're walking through. Another, I'll give you another illustration, a very similar situation. I didn't get a finger in my face, but I got words in my face. And this particular individual didn't like what I was doing and the direction that I was going. And he thought he knew better than I did, so he came at me. And so I'm thinking, well, I did this last time, then I'll do this this time. Because that's how we operate, right? But another verse came to my mind. And the verse that came to my mind is where Jesus said, the kingdom of God suffered violence and the violent take it by force. <laughs> now, I didn't fight that individual, but I put them in their place. See, the Word will show you what to do, when to do it, in a diversity of situations that you could never calculate and figure out on your own. That's why we have to be in the Word. So I just want to give you a warning. If, if you come at me and put your finger in my face, I, I may be kind and I may be not. <laughs> it's just going to depend on what verse rises up on the inside of me. Can I get an amen? Thank you, Pastor Noah. So over to my left and to your right, we have all kinds of resources for you to help you take a step. One of the resources for you is a 21-day prayer and fasting guide. In the back of this guide, in the resource section, we have all different kinds of reading plans for you that you can uh, adopt for 2020. There's whole Bible reading plans, there's partial Bible reading plans, there's New Testament plans. There, I don't care where you are in your journey, take a step to get in the Word of God. If you've never really devoured the Word, then there's some plans there that will help you take some steps. If, if you've read the New Testament, but you want to read the whole Bible, there's some plans that will help you. I don't care what step you take. Take a step relative to where you are towards what God's calling you to do. Can somebody say amen to that? Make 2020 a different year by taking a step to get in the Word. If you'll do that, it has the power to make 2020 a dream year. Here's the second habit that I would love for you to adopt is to fast and pray. Fast and pray. Fast and pray. Make fasting a prayer and prayer a part of your habit, a part of your routine, a part of your lifestyle. I'll remind you of this, of all the things that the disciples could have asked Jesus to teach them how to do, this was the only thing they asked him to teach them. 
Jesus, teach us to pray. Well, what does that mean? It means the disciples understood the secret to Jesus and his ministry was prayer and fasting. They understood that the power to do what God had called him to do resided in their connection with God. I mean, think about this for just a moment. In, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, I don't say a thing that I don't hear the Father saying. I don't do a thing that I don't see the Father doing. Jesus is literally communicating. My very existence flows out of my relationship with God. Everything and I say, everything that I do comes out of prayer and fasting, out of my communion with God. Listen, you want, you want more power in your life? Pray. You want more peace in your life? Pray. You want more joy in your life? Pray. You want to see more things change in your life? Pray. Make it your habit to spend time alone with God. And this morning, I, I could spend the entire time just talking about this one principle and, and how prayer changes your life. How, how it, just, it just absolutely revolutionizes everything in your existence. But I just want to focus on one thing that I think is overlooked. A promise that prayer holds. That I believe we overlook far too often. And the promise that prayer holds is a secure identity. See, when I spend time with my Father, Not only do I receive power and peace and joy, not only do, do I receive direction and answers to my prayer, but my identity at the core of who I am is securely fixed. And can I tell you, if there's one cultural issue that is plaguing our society today, it's identities that are not fixed in the right place. Look at this verse at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. In Matthew chapter 3, he goes down and he's baptized by John the Baptist. And the Bible records that as soon as Jesus came out of the water, a voice from heaven said, This is my son. This is my son whom I love and with him I am well pleased. Before Jesus did a single miracle, before he took a step into ministry, his heavenly father wanted to make sure that his identity was securely fixed in the right place. If Jesus needed that, who are we not to need the same? Je the Father says, this is my son. What is the Father saying? He's saying over Jesus, I accept you for who you are. The Father was settling his acceptance. But not only did he settle his acceptance, he goes, not only do I accept you, but I love you. I'm giving you my affection. We all need acceptance. We all need affection. It's who God has designed us to be. And then thirdly, he affirms him and says, with you, I am well pleased. Acceptance, affection, and affirmation. Core identity issues that we all have to have fixed or we go running from them to fill them in all the wrong places. See, prayer, ministering with my heavenly Father, spending time communion with Him, fix my acceptance and my affection and my affirmation. And so it doesn't matter what other people say or what other people think or, or what they feel about me, how they behave. Because once I get the God-sized hole in me secured... I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. See, the benefit of prayer isn't just power. It's an identity that is securely fixed in God. Today, we're kicking off 21 days of prayer and fasting. 
And I just want to invite you to join us on this journey over the next 21 days. We have, over again, over to my left, to your right, we have a lot of resources for you. I'm going to point out a couple things. Number one, we have these blue booklets that are called Pray First Prayer Guides. In these booklets are all kinds of different prayer models to help you spend time connecting with God. I encourage you to take one of these this Sunday. We have enough for everybody. Secondly, we have the, the prayer guide, 21 day prayer and fasting guide. And in this, we outline different types of fasts that you can do. A whole fast, a partial fast, a, a daily fast. And then goals that you can write out that you want to see happen in 2020. And things that you want to list out. God, over the next 21 days, I, 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 want, I want revelation, knowledge, these things to happen in my life. I want to encourage you to take these things, write them out. Something happens miraculously when we write things out and put them down on paper rather than just think about them in our heads. And so these are resources for you. Pick up one of these resources and, and journey with us over the next 21 days as we set aside all kinds of distractions and things that take us away from our relationship with God and focus on Him. One other thing that I'll point you to is that the next four Wednesday nights, the month, during the month of January, we're going to have worship and prayer services here in the sanctuary from 6.30 to 7.30. I invite you to join us as we just spend time worshiping and praying together on Wednesday nights over the course of the month of January. During that time period, we're going to worship and we're going to pray, but we're also going to put some resources in your hands. We're going to teach you some different prayer models. There's all kinds of different prayer models that the Bible gives us so that prayer doesn't become redundant and, and, and obligation, but we have different tools so that we can use different things and it doesn't become drudgery. You know what I'm talking about. And so I invite you to join us on Wednesday nights at 6.30 during the month of January. And we're going to worship and we're going to pray and, and we're going to teach you some prayer models that you can utilize in your day-to-day -day life because I believe this habit holds great potential for your life. Here's the third habit that I would like for you to embrace is simply to attend church. Attend church. Attend church. Say attend. Attend. Attend church. One of the things that you find that's pretty interesting as you dive into the Word of God, and I think for the last, I'm going on close to 10 years, that I've read the Bible cover to cover every year. And one of the things that you discover are just patterns and themes and, and just overarching principles when you do that. One of the things that I discovered was is that in the Old Testament, every time Israel turned away from God, there was a correlation in their devaluing of temple worship. When they devalued just attending church in the Old Testament, it led to debauchery for the nation. Interestingly enough, every time they restored temple worship, it led to revival in the land. I, I, I can't tell you, I cannot overemphasize how important it is to prioritize weekly church attendance. I, I, I think in our culture, just in case you were wondering, it is increasingly devalued. I'm not talking about with the world. I'm talking about among believers. That, that believers attend church less and less and less frequently than they ever have before. Man, I don't think there's an ironic coincidence that culture continues to become more deplorable by day. I make church a priority in your life. And here's the benefit, here's the prize when you do so. Encouragement and support. In Hebrews chapter 10, the writer says, Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. 
Let us consider how we may spur, how, how we may encourage one another, how we may motivate one another, how, how we may support one another towards love and good deeds. Well, how do we do that? Well, number one, we do it by not giving up meeting together. We do it by making it a priority to be in church week in and week out. But unfortunately, some have now developed the habit of not doing that, is what the writer says. That, that was happening in the early church, that, that some had, had given up this habit of meeting together, and as a result of that, there was no longer encouragement and support towards love and good deeds going. And so the writer's trying to correct this habit that's gotten off the tracks. But, but do it. But encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Listen, just making church a priority in your life week in and week out has great benefits for our lives. And one of the benefits is encouragement and support. How many of you guys could use regular encouragement and support? I mean, beyond the incredible worship team that we have. And my amazing self. <laughs> Just the benefit of meeting together and seeing your brothers and sisters in Christ and receiving encouragement and a smile and knowing you're not in this thing alone makes a difference. It makes an amazing difference in your life. It's almost incalculable the difference attending church regularly can make in your life. But Harvard University has attempted to define the benefit of weekly church attendance. And I, and I saw these statistics. I've, I've used these some. It's a relatively new study that they're continuing to update over the last couple of years. They found this. Among children and teenagers who were raised attending church once a week, they found they were a third less likely to do drugs, a third less likely to engage in premarital sex, and a third more likely to serve others. That regular church attendance among children and teenagers re reduced the risk of depression and premature death by 40%. And divorce by 50%. They reported an overall greater satisfaction with life, better able to process emotions, and just in general, people raised in church were more gracious and forgiving. That's Harvard University, guys. They have found that there's a pretty significant benefit from just attending church weekly. The author of the study, the professor, is quoted as saying, hmm, service attendance may be a powerful and underappreciated health resource in our society. Shocking. I want to challenge you in this habit in 2020. Make it a habit to be in church weekly. Now, what does that look like? I know people's lives are people's lives. But there's several different ways that you can do that. If you can't, I encourage you to be here on a Sunday. I'm, I'm, I kind of like it. I think it's beneficial to you. I think it's helpful. But, you know, we have a lot of other ways. We have every Wednesday night, we have ministry going on. If you can't make it on a Sunday, make it a priority to be here on a Wednesday. We have small groups that are meeting almost every time during the course of the week. Every day during the course of the week. Make it a priority just to attend church in some capacity every week. Why? Because God's culture is attempting to indoctrinate you 24-7. And my question to you is, what are you doing to counteract that indoctrination? If you're not here once a week, I make you this promise you're not doing enough. Why? Because God said every week you need a Sabbath. 
And Sabbath is not just about rest, it's also about worship. It's not just about putting my feet up and recharging. It's also about lifting my head heavenward and connecting to the one who is the source for everything in my life. Make it your habit to be in church weekly and it has the power to change everything in your life. Number four is, am I killing you this morning or am I helping you? Am I helping you? Number four is serve. Fourth habit that... I would encourage you to adopt in order to have your dream year in 2020 is to serve. God has not created us to be consumers. He's created us to be contributors. Jesus did not leave heaven and come to earth in order to save us and leave us where we are and to have what we need just for ourselves. No, he has come to save us that we might be agents of reconciliation to the world around us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We have been given the ministry of reconciliation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20 says, We are therefore Christ's ambassador as if he is making his appeal to the world through us. Here's the benefit of serving. Here's the benefit of, of getting involved in serving beyond just attending. Attending has great benefits, but another step beyond attending is serving. And, and the benefit of serving is growth. The teacher always learns more than the students. It's a universal principle. And when I take the step to get in the game, to lead a small group, to be a part of the greeting team or the hospitality team or the worship team or the prayer team or the kids ministry team, when I take a step to serve others, I grow. I get better. Everything in my life takes a, a tick up. I, I grow in my understanding of the Word because now I'm learning how to apply what I'm reading. I'm learning to apply what I'm praying. I, I'm now putting it on flesh and working out my salvation. Serve. Serve causes us to grow. It, 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 it leads to growth in our, our abilities and in our skills and our anointing. Listen, you, you want to walk in a greater level of anointing in your life? You want more of God's power on your life? Then serve. Because when you take a step up in leadership, you may, how many of you guys have heard, with new levels come new devils? That is true. But can I give you a better promise than that? With new levels comes new anointing. More power. You want more power in your life? Serve. Because God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. Peter's saying this. Each of you should use whatever gift. I don't, I don't care what it looks like. Every, Peter's saying everybody's got a gift. Everybody's gift is different. Whatever that gift looks like, you need to... Use that gift that you have received to do this, to serve others, to serve others, to serve others, to serve others, to serve others. And when we do this, the Bible says we begin to faithfully administer God's grace in its various forms. Immediately following the 11 o'clock service today, and we do this the first and second Sunday of every month, we do something called CLC Connect. And, and CLC Connect really has three purposes, and it's very simple. We, we want you to find out about the vision and the values and the ministries of Christian Life Church. Number one. Number two, we want to find out about your gifts and your passions and your callings and how, how God has uniquely knit you together. We want to find out about your whatever gifts. Why? so that we can best figure out how to partner together most effectively to administer God's grace in its various forms throughout this community. And if you're not serving in some capacity, 
There's no day like today. Hang around. Go grab something to eat. Come back after the 11 o'clock service in Omega Zone, building to my left and to your right. And Pastor Trey will begin this process for you so that you can find a place to serve. And when you serve, the reward is growth. You grow up into the more full measure of the fullness of God and begin to administer His grace in its various forms as you serve people, making an impact in their life. Take a step. Take a step. Take a step. Number five, and finally today, give. Give. The most physical and practical way we demonstrate our love for God and our faith in Him is our giving. I want to say that again so you get it this morning. The most physical and practical way we demonstrate our love for God and our faith in Him is in our giving. When I give of my resources for the advancement of His kingdom locally and nationally and internationally, what I am practically demonstrating is, God, you're number one in my life, and I'm honoring you with what you have imparted to me. I'm stewarding it well. How many of you guys understand we're just stewards of the gifts of God? Everything that we have is a gift from Him. And so, God, number one, I'm going to honor you. I'm going to give. I'm going to tithe. I'm going to give you the first 10% as a demonstration of my love for you. And number two, my faith in you. I, I'm going to give the first 10% because I understand you're my source above and beyond a job or a paycheck or a person. God, you're my source, and so I'm going to demonstrate my faith in you. And the promise, the reward of giving is blessing and faith. See, Galatians chapter 5 tells us that God will not be mocked. Whatever a man sows, that's what he will reap. That God has created a universal principle, and it's called sowing and reaping. And, and can I tell you, you don't even have to be a believer to participate in this principle. It's a universal law that God has created. He said, whatever you sow, that is what you're going to reap. Now, I don't give to reap, but I can't give and not reap, God says. I can't give and not be blessed because God has created this principle. And when, I'm give, when I give and I'm blessed, you know what else happens? Faith. 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 You want more faith in your life? The most practical way that you can develop faith in your life is in your giving. Because the Bible says you can't give and not be blessed. And when you give and are blessed, the byproduct of that is faith begins to rise in my life. I believe that God can do all things. The last book of the Old Testament book of Malachi verse 3 God says this bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and then listen this is amazing test me in this says the Lord do you know this is the only place in scripture from Genesis to Revelation where the Bible commands us to test God. As a matter of fact, when Jesus was tempted, one of the things that he told the enemy is, the Bible says not to test God. There's one exception. It's in your giving. He says, test me in this and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven. See if I will not bless you so much there will not be room enough to store it. Now that's a blessing. And, and, and when that happens, not only will he bless us, I love this in verse 11, he'll prevent pests from devouring your cop. See, what blessing, what giving does is it causes you to be blessed, number one. Number two, it rebukes the devourer from stealing the blessing. Have you ever felt like at times the enemy stealing your blessing? The Bible says that he'll rebuke the devourer. The vines in your field will not drop their fruit before it's ripe. I challenge you this morning 
If you want 2020 to be a dream year, a year unlike any you've ever had before, adopt these five spiritual habits. They will bring transformation to your life. Well, what, are, what are those habits? We're going to read the Word. We're going to pray and we're going to fast. We're going to make attending church a, a priority in our life. We're going to serve and we're going to give. And can I tell you, there's one key here. Do them all consistently. Do them all consistently. When, I quoted the verse in Galatians just a moment ago to you. It says, whatever a man sows, that's what he's going to reap. The word sow there is the, actually the word sows, plural. What that means is whatever you sow, whatever you plant, whatever you do, whatever habit you form and you continue to do it over and over and over and over and over again, it will cause you to reap something. It's not talking about, I'm going to read my Bible every now and then. I'm going to attend church every now and then. I'm going to give every now and then. I'm going to serve. No, no. This becomes a habit in my life. It causes transfer. So my message to you this morning is very simple. Take a step and start a habit. Take a step and start a habit. I don't know where you are in those five habits. You know exactly where you are. You know what habit you need to start right now. And I want to challenge you to make a commitment to God today to take a step start a habit. Stand with me where you are this morning. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I have two questions for you. My first question is this. Do you know Jesus? Have you given your heart and your life to Him? Have you surrendered to His will and His way for your life? If, if you haven't done that, there's no time like the present. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you'd like to give your life to Jesus today, would you just simply raise your hand? I want to pray for you this morning. Is there anyone today? Say, so, Pastor, I want to give my life to Jesus. Is there anyone? Thank you for that hand. Thank you for that hand. Anybody else this morning? Thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. There's no step that you can take that is greater than a step towards Jesus. Church, will you pray this after me this morning? Jesus... I thank you today for your love, your grace, and your forgiveness. I ask you to forgive me, cleanse me of my sins. I submit to you, I surrender my will to your way. I ask you to take up residence in my life, to lead me and to guide me into all truth in Jesus' name.